This is where we live on Connecticut Public. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. The president has said the pandemic is over, but public health officials say not so fast, reminding Americans there are still COVID deaths each day. 353 is the daily average, according to the CDC. There's also potential variants ahead and vulnerable populations still exist. Also, not everyone eligible for the COVID vaccine or boosters has gotten them. Today, where we live, we talked to Connecticut's top public health official, Dr. Manisha Jutani. It's been one year since she started as commissioner of the State Department of Public Health. Coming up, we ask her about the latest COVID booster and why uptake for the COVID vaccine remains low for Connecticut children. Also, this month, New York State declared a polio emergency. How concerned are Connecticut officials? Now, what questions do you have for Commissioner Giutani? You can join us, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WNPR. Or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Commissioner Giutani joins us now on Zoom. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. I mentioned it's been a year since you took over. How are you feeling? Thanks for recognizing that milestone. It's been a very fulfilling and interesting year. I feel as if I came into this job at a time when somebody with my background and training had an opportunity to give back, and it's been an honor to serve the people of Connecticut. Mm. Remind our listeners, when you mentioned your background and training, you know, you know where you come from. You are a public health official. So I am a public health official now, but I started as an infectious disease physician and an academic And a lot of my research was based on infections in long-term care settings. And so I come to this job with a background in infectious diseases, which has helped for many of the issues that we have faced in this last year. And in addition, because of my training in long-term care and knowledge of healthcare settings, it has been extremely helpful and informative as we've addressed issues in both hospital settings and in long-term care settings. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about uh, President Biden's statement on 60 Minutes uh, the other week that the pandemic is over. What is your response to that? So, you know, we certainly are in a new phase of the pandemic. And the response in terms of what is the state response, what is the federal government response, certainly has changed. And I think that there are many aspects of that that have come to a conclusion or are winding down as in terms of our state response in Connecticut. But what we do know is that this virus is not going away. This virus is here to stay. And we have to change the way we think about how we are going to approach the consequences of this virus and how as government we respond. There are certain things that were in the lap of government before, which have now been spread out much more broadly. And I think that's where the change has really come. And people have been living through this pandemic for two years. I think people are aware that the virus is not going away, but our response has changed. And I think that's what that statement I take as reflecting. So what will it take for the pandemic to end, Commissioner? You know, it's it's funny. I think this is one of those situations where it started in a full blast and everybody was aware because of the responses that we had to take right in the beginning. But it's going to peter out is the way I think about it. It's not going to be like one fine day this pandemic is over. It's going to slowly unwind. And there are various aspects that have been unwinding for many, many months, in fact. And so I don't know exactly when the pandemic phase will be over. I think we are going into a winter season where particularly in the Northeast, we know all respiratory viral diseases circulate more. We know that we have workforce issues in healthcare settings going into this winter season. And so what is that going to look like as we're entering the first fall and winter season when masking is much less common than it has been before over these last two years? So I think a lot is unknown. We have certain ideas of what may come. We are making plans and being prepared for how we will address that to the best of our ability. But I think these are some of the unknowns. And I am not inclined to sort of let my guard down in terms of what the impact of COVID could be in terms of our healthcare settings, particularly as we go into this most uh, recent fall and winter season. Tell me more when you bring up workforce issues as we head into a winter where respiratory uh, illnesses can be prevalent. Uh, What are your concerns? 
Well, you know, I think in the beginning of this pandemic, the public recognized the contributions of healthcare workers and healthcare heroes. But over time, it is difficult to sustain that level of intensity in terms of response, both on the side of healthcare, but also in terms of the general public. And so now people do have to go about the various aspects of life that we all need to do, but healthcare workers are still doing their part that they do every single day in hospitals. And, you know, there are people that have left the workforce. We're either at an age where the burdens of COVID care and sort of the challenges of overall health care no longer became worth it to them. And so there are people who certainly have left the workforce. There have been several state initiatives to bolster workforce development, but these types of initiatives take time. And some of the things that we did over the last couple of years where we were able to bring in new workers to the state, some of that has been codified into state law so that we have compact licenses and some reciprocity with other states that are going into effect as of October 1st to make bringing some professions into the state more possible. But overall, there has been attrition in healthcare. And so that's what I mean by workforce shortages is that everybody has been looking at where they can get bodies to take care of people. We know that particularly in nursing, uh, pool nurses and nurses that you know have gone to various different states, travelers have been utilized a lot over the pandemic and respiratory viral season, many hospitals always rely on them no matter what year it is. And now here we have a year that is, you know, as we're emerging from the pandemic, from COVID and other respiratory viruses that we just have to be aware of. And so just thinking through what are the things that we're going to be able to do to be able to help our healthcare facilities, which is ultimately now at this point in the pandemic, what I'm most concerned about. Are you hearing from hospital systems, that Commissioner, that are concerned about this season ahead? So I'm in regular contact with the Connecticut Hospital Association. I meet with the CEOs of the various hospitals. We've done that many times over the last um, year that I've been in this job. I will be meeting with them again shortly. And I think that what I've been hearing over the last several months is that they, too, have been making preparations because they, too, have the same concerns I do. So every healthcare system has been doing their part to make preparations for this upcoming season. But I do think regardless, you know, human bodies and people trained personnel that have the skill set that we need is at the end of the day, a finite commodity. It's something that we have only a certain amount of, and you cannot replicate people with skills that quickly. We were saying that in the beginning of the pandemic, but here we are now two years into this and recognizing that that's something that we're going to continue to have to work towards. You're hearing with us on Zoom, Dr. Manisha Jutani, Commissioner of Connecticut's Department of Public Health. As we talk about this uh, late fall and winter season ahead, if you have questions about the COVID booster, you can join us, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. So let's talk about that, uh, Commissioner. Pfizer and Moderna uh, began offering the, these new booster shots in September to combat Omicron subvariants of, of the COVID virus. The New York Times reporting uh, just the other day, only about half of adults have received a booster shot. That's according to a Kaiser Family Foundation uh, recent poll. More than 20 percent have not received any vaccine shot. So how's Connecticut doing? So we have administered close to 100,000 booster doses of the new bivalent booster since its release in early September. And most of those doses, I would say they're spread out across the age groups, but Certainly the most number are in the older age groups. So particularly in the 65 plus age group, which is good because, you know, look, at the end of the day, we do want older people to remember that the morbidity and mortality associated with COVID has consistently throughout this pandemic hit older populations the most. And that is a group of people that has been in the hospital the most. And so, again, if we're looking at what is going to tip the scales in our healthcare system, it is going to be hospital burden. And for our older members of society, I do want to reiterate that if it's been two months since your last booster, you are eligible for this booster shot. And getting this shot with your flu shot, just going into this next season, flu has been 
low for the last couple of years. We do anticipate it's going to be much higher this year. We already see activity. We already know that flu was bad in the Southern hemisphere. So we're expecting a worse flu season than usual. And so I really, really encourage everybody who's eligible to get a bivalent booster shot, but particularly for our older people, I really strongly recommend it. So let's break that down further, Commissioner. We got a tweet from Fred uh, who has a question on when he should get, he guesses, his number five shot. I received my fourth end of June 2022. Do I even need to get another booster? It's only been, what, less than that, three months. What should I do? So again, uh, you mentioned older adults should get their second booster if it's been two months. But for other ages, you know, what is your recommendation? You know, I understand this is a challenging question because for some people, they waited a little bit, particularly as you just said in this example, where maybe that last booster wasn't administered in April. And so now it's maybe only a few months or three, four months, something like that. So there are a few things I would say. First of all, if it's been two months since your last booster, you certainly are eligible. If you've had COVID, which a lot of people did over this last several months, you can wait 90 days to get your booster. My challenge with this, it's like trying to time the stock market. When is it going to be the right time to get that booster? It is a challenging question. However, what I would say is that we do see upticks in transmission of COVID. And so going into this most recent season that we're facing now, I would err on the side of getting it, you know, sort of sooner than later. So for your example, certainly two months have passed and you're certainly eligible for the booster shot. I would say that, you know, going into these next several months, it's going to be very difficult to time. So in the month of October, before, you know, all of flu and everything else is really off and running like we would expect it to be, I would say just get it. And that will likely get you through six months of a respiratory viral season. Mm -hmm. So asking for a friend named Lucy uh, who got COVID (laughs) in July. (laughs) I'm under 50, Commissioner. So the recommendation for someone like me uh, to get a a second booster, is October the time to do it? I I would, Lucy. That's what I... I've recommended that to family members. I I have a family member who also got it in July. And, you know, we have sort of October as the date um, going forward in terms of that 90 day. Again, like I said, you know, I think this is so difficult to really try to like thread the needle just right. You know, oh, when is it going to be really bad? And, you know, and, and then invariably when people do that, then they get COVID in between. And so, you know, my challenge with that is, Look, we've heard from people who have suffered so much from COVID, from long COVID. And yes, there are people who've had asymptomatic COVID or really recovered pretty quickly. But this is a relatively minor intervention to do. And so I would say, Lucy, you know, having had it in July, my recommendation would be to wait the 90 days. And again, it doesn't need to be on the 90th day, but, you know, get it after that. If you have questioners for DPH Commissioner Dr. Nisha Jutani, you can join us as well, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. And I know that we're, what, two and a half years or more now into this pandemic, but, you know, I guess, is it easy for some people to forget, you know, obviously you want to protect yourself. This is also about protecting others around you who may not be able to get this vaccine, Commissioner. So this is such an important point for several levels. There are actually three parts to it, as I think of it, Lucy. So the first is protecting your older family members. Remember, their immunity is not as strong as yours. So even if they get the booster or if they haven't gotten the booster for some reason, by you getting vaccinated, you're preventing transmission. And again, One of the things people have to remember with the bivalent booster is this is a new product than what you received before. I know a lot of people are just kind of tired of this. I don't want to keep pumping new things into my body, new shots. How many times do I need this shot? This is a new product. This is going to protect against BA4, BA5. And so there are people who are saying, you know what, I got all the shots and I still got COVID. Well, that is possible. No vaccine is 100% effective at preventing transmission. But this new bivalent booster is going to be our best shot at protecting transmission because it is protecting against the newer variants. And we do not, at the moment, 
have other variants on the horizon. I'm going to knock on wood on that statement that we are particularly worried about. So that's good news going into this season, that we have something at our disposal to protect those that are more vulnerable around us. But there are two other aspects of this. The second is we want our children to be staying in school. If we prevent transmission of this virus, if we get our kids vaccinated, if we get our kids boosted, if teachers are boosted, we now have the opportunity to reduce transmission in school settings and allow for as many children to be in school full time for as long as possible. And then the third part is what I've been talking about, which is the burden on our healthcare workforce and on our hospital systems. We are already seeing an uptick in the number of patients in the hospital. We hit 400 patients with COVID in the hospital about a week ago. That is the first time we had hit that number since February of 2022. The number went down because our hospitals are good at taking care of COVID patients now. And so they were able to discharge people and get people back out. But I do expect that that number will continue to rise over the next couple of weeks. When I talk about a burdened healthcare system, just think about any of your loved ones who are going through maybe cancer treatment or God forbid, have a heart attack or a stroke or are overburdening emergency departments. And if we have a lot of COVID patients in that setting, all the other care gets shortchanged as well. And so really it's all three of these points, protecting those we love around us, keeping our kids in school and preventing transmission in our community and protecting our healthcare workforce and our hospital systems. If you are on the fence on whether to get these booster, please think about these three things and think again, and maybe just go out there and get the shot. Because you mentioned school children, this was something we wanted to ask you. You know, what is the rate of of children that are that have received the, the the COVID vaccine, and what more can you do to encourage parents who are on the fence, Commissioner? So, you know, our lowest uptake is in the zero to four age group. You know, that's the last group that's rolled out. That is about 10 percent for five to nine year olds that have received one dose, I should say, for the zero to four year olds. For five to nine year olds, we're about 50 percent. Then we go from 10 to 14 year olds at about 73 percent. By the time you get to 15 year olds, you're up to 85 percent. What a great testament to our community in Connecticut. You know, we all were able to do this together, that our oldest children really are vaccinated at similar levels to adults. For our younger children, look, I understand parents at the end of the day are really just doing what they think is best for their kids. They are nervous. They don't want to do something that hasn't been tried and tested. But at the end of the day, this is a vaccine that rolled out in children the last because we always want to put our children at the least risk. And we've seen years now of success with these vaccines. So, you know, I continue with our message in terms of what works in terms of the vaccine messaging. But I do think there are other things parents can think about. You know, I talked about keeping kids in school. We've talked about, you know, mental health of our children. We've seen that through this pandemic, being in school is the best place for our kids. And if that's going to help improve your child's mental health and keeping them vaccinated and allowing them to stay in school will also help with that. That's another thing to think about. So, you know, there are a lot of things that parents have to consider when they're thinking about the well-being of their children. But I would say that that's one other thing to consider. This is where we live on Connecticut Public. My guest today, Dr. Manisha Jutani, Commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Public Health. We'll continue talking after a short break and take your questions to 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WNPR. Or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This 
is where we live on Connecticut Public. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. My guest today is Dr. Manisha Jutani, Connecticut's Public Health Commissioner. You can ha- ask your question of her at 888-720-9677 or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Uh, Commissioner Kate tweeted, in a world where people are expected to protect themselves by one-way masking, do Connecticut residents have access to high-quality respiratory PPE or 95 respirators? And she says, in terms of availability, affordability, sizes, and shapes that fit the various uh, faces of diverse populations. What can you tell her? So I think we've seen through this pandemic that certainly the free marketplace has risen to the challenge. And there are so many different types of masks that are available on the market. Uh, In addition to that, I would say that as a state, we have given out millions and millions and and continue to do so, I will say, of uh, different types of PPE for schools, for state agencies, for healthcare facilities that have been struggling to identify pieces of PPE that may suit their population. And so this is something that as a state, in terms of our preparedness response, has been there to be able to also help respond to this. So I think between what people are able to do to protect themselves through things that are available in the marketplace, but in addition, what we've done as a state, it's actually quite remarkable in terms of what is available compared to what was available over two years ago. Uh, Kathy tweeted the other day, uh, you know, do we have reliable numbers about the percentage of Connecticut residents who have ended up with long COVID, Commissioner? This is a very challenging question. We don't have strict numbers right now. And I think part of that is the definition of long COVID. You know, what does it mean to have long COVID? And what I've been very heartened to see is the CDC, the NIH are taking all of these things very, very seriously. We have collaborators at Yale, for example, I know are starting a large cohort study of long-term COVID survivors, long haulers. You know, there's the recover platform, the recover study through the NIH where people can sign up. And these are different platforms that will help us get a better sense of the number of people that are suffering. You know, I met a friend this weekend who never actually tested positive for COVID, but has been diagnosed with long COVID. And he has completely had a change in life, was a marathon runner, uh, really sleeps for 12 hours a day and never has restorative sleep. This is a real condition. It is something that people have recognized now. There are inflammatory markers that can show signs of that and other testing that can be done. And I think we need as a healthcare community to continue to build out resources to one, help identify how many people this really is and what are the treatments potentially that they can get to be able to hopefully get back to their usual selves. You can join us if you have a question or comment, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. You know, moving on from COVID, hopefully, maybe if we have time, we can circle back, Commissioner. But, you know, I mentioned that New York State, uh, an emergency over polio detected there. I'm wondering if you can uh, share some insight, and should we be concerned here? So as soon as that first case was identified in New York State, we were in conversations with the CDC and trying to assess our risk. And one of the first things that we were able to do with collaboration with the CDC was have historic wastewater samples that were done in Connecticut for COVID going back to May of this year and going through August so far, but we have ongoing testing too. And so we had 87 different samples that were tested and all negative for polio. So that was at least reassuring that we do not have any positive samples to date. Because of what was identified in Nassau County, which is a little closer, I mean, Rockland County, Nassau County, they're both sort of around us in terms of Connecticut. We wanted to do continued wastewater testing. And so the CDC has been a great collaborator in this way. And we are looking forward to more test results going forward. Uh, As of yesterday afternoon, I believe Connecticut had 124 cases of monkeypox. So can you update us uh, further, Commissioner? And is there an adequate supply of the two-dose monkeypox vaccine for populations that medical uh, professionals say should be getting this? Yeah, so absolutely. First of all, like you said, we've had 124 cases. In the last week, we only had one new case. 
that is um, at least heartening. I don't know that we've totally turned the curve, but at least the fact that it seems to be slowing is a good thing. We've administered almost 6,500 doses of the monkeypox vaccine, and we have plenty of doses available throughout the state. We have many different sites where people can go to get vaccinated. And we actually updated our eligibility criteria so that even a broader group of people are eligible as of this past Monday, September 26th, all through the same sites that we've been administering vaccine through for the last several weeks and months. So I am hopeful, but I think this is the not the kind of thing we can take our guard down with because we do not want this to be the kind of disease where it ends up continuing to circulate in certain at-risk populations. And, you know, for example, we had a, a homeless person that was diagnosed with monkeypox. We don't want this virus to end up in communities where there could be high risk and then potentially not have covered. So we've been very broad in our thoughts in terms of how we're going to vaccinate at-risk groups, continuing to have targeted messaging and targeted vaccination as well. But I am heartened to see that what we've done over the last three months has made a difference, uh, both through you know, vaccination, education efforts, change in behavior, change in where we are able to administer the vaccine and really such a partnership with our community partners, which has made a huge difference. And Commissioner, you said that as of last Monday, the eligibility for the vaccine has been broadened, I think, in our state. So who is eligible at this moment to get the monkeypox vaccine? One of the things that we wanted to do in terms of our revision this time around was that, you know, for one of the things that's been guiding this is that, you know, if somebody has had multiple sexual partners in the last, you know, several months, but what I wanted to do and what we as a DPH team discussed was that there are people that have changed their behavior, but as people see less risk, they might start taking more risk going forward. So one of the things we did was to say that if you are intending to have multiple sexual partners over the next six months, that you would be eligible for this vaccine. And I think that what that does is it broadens the scope of people that could potentially be starting to maybe change their behavior as they see numbers becoming a little bit more under control and thinking that maybe the virus is going away, at the same time protecting the groups of people that have been most at risk. Again, you can join us if you have a question or comment. I'm going to give the number out one more time, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. I said we were moving on from COVID, but you know, I should ask you about you know how um, DPH is monitoring nursing homes uh, with populations who are most at risk for COVID. You know, what are the protocols to protect uh, you know these uh, residents there, and you know how are you monitoring uh, COVID transmission in these facilities, Commissioner? So as you know, this was one of the areas hit the hardest at the beginning of the pandemic, and we've been laser focused on COVID, as has the nursing home industry throughout these last several years. So the infection control policies are very regulated. We educate homes all the time about any changes that happen in this. We are promoting booster shots, both for staff and for nursing home residents. One of the things that has been so great is if you look at the number of deaths from COVID from the beginning of the pandemic to what has happened over these last several months, it's really remarkable. And so the number of COVID-related deaths is extremely low in the long-term care setting. And so, you know, we have seen, you know, staff cases go up as community levels go up. Right now, they've been plateaued for some time because that's what we've seen in the community as well. And so what happens in long-term care really mimics what's happening in the community because people and staff workers work and work, live in the community and work then in nursing homes. And so we continue to work with our industry partners to be able to address COVID and have done it very, very well. Uh, before we run out of tw- time, uh, <laughs> Commissioner, uh, you know, the, your office uh, touches uh, many different areas uh, because of, of the public health focus. You know, you know, we wanted to mention that, you know, there is and it's warranted to have a focus in our country on mental health. Uh, uh, WNPR reporting that crisis calls to United Way operated centers surged 40 percent since the summer when the 988 number was rolled out. I wonder if you can give us some perspective there. 
So I think what we're seeing is, you know, we already knew that mental health was a serious issue before this pandemic, but going into this pandemic and as we're emerging from it, there are so many stressors on the minds of people and particularly our young people. And it, this is going to require an all of state approach which is happening as we see, you know, the investment, for example, in school-based health centers, DPH is expanding the number of sites of school-based health centers and behavioral health in schools, trying to catch children where they are every day before they end up in crisis. I mean, we are fortunate to have numbers like 988 for a hotline, a suicide hotline, to be able to provide that type of instantaneous help to young people and anybody, quite frankly, for that matter. But I think that we are going to need to continue to work with our partners to address all these issues, as we've seen, you know, opioids, mental health, all of these things that are emerging as we come out of this pandemic. And as we've talked about in this segment, Lucy, you know, we've had, for example, five cases of West Nile virus. We talked about polio. We've talked about monkeypox. Infectious diseases are all around us. We have our plate full at DPH. But really, it's going to be working with all of our partners to be able to address all these issues together. You've been hearing Dr. Manisha Jutani, again, Commissioner of Connecticut's Department of Public Health. Uh, I know you have to run. Thank you for the time you've given us today, Commissioner. Thank you so much for having me, Lucy. This is where we live on Connecticut Public. Coming up, we're going to talk to people who had COVID and have been dealing with lingering symptoms. Are you one of them? You can join us too, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WNPR or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. One in 13 adults in the United States have long COVID symptoms or symptoms lasting three or more months after first contracting the virus. That's according to data from the Household Pulse Survey in June. There's a Long COVID Research Institute at Yale University, part of a privately funded consortium announced this month. It has an initial investment of $15 million from Balvi, a fund from the co-founder of Ethereum, a blockchain platform. Scientists will study why and how some people get long COVID. My next guests have been living with lingering symptoms. Uh, first joining us on the phone is Frank Ziegler, who's a participant in LISTEN. It's a long COVID study at Yale School of Medicine. He's an attorney in Nashville. Frank, welcome to the show. Thank you, Lucy. So when did you get COVID and what did you experience, Frank? I have tested positive for COVID in January of 2021, and for me, it was very mild. It was a standard sinus infection, uh, like I'd had many times over the years. After about 20 days with an antibiotic, um, I got better. I lost smell, aside from just kind of being stopped up, and it was about two months later that I started developing uh, issues and symptoms that I had not ever had before. Mm. What were those symptoms, Frank? I lost a pretty significant amount of weight. Um, I noticed that I was uh, developed hand tremors, shortness of breath, and cognitive memory issues. Mm. So that must have been concerning for you. You know, you battled COVID and you thought that you were on the road to recovery, and then these symptoms popped up. And so what did you do then, Frank? It was very concerning. I sent in a text or a message to my primary care physician and said, I'm worried about these things. Um, do you think that we should have a visit? Are you seeing this in any of your other patients? Because the time frame is there wasn't known, much known about long COVID at the time. And he responded back and said, well, we can have a visit if you want to, but I'm seeing this in other patients. Okay. So then that you were left to, to maybe find another specialist? And were you expecting that response? I was not expecting that response at all. Yeah. Um, I've seen him for several years and mainly for sinus infections. And uh, it, it really upset me to receive that response from him. So I'm in Nashville. Vanderbilt University is in Nashville. So I contacted their infectious disease department just on a whim to see if maybe they could tell me what was happening. And they were starting a long COVID clinic to which I was, uh, I, I joined the long COVID clinic. I did not have any referrals. 
Uh, but based on what I was dealing with, they were as interested in me as I was in them. Mm. So at least you were you were finding uh, a place to you know hopefully get more answers. And so it's been another several months. You know how are you doing now? And do you feel like uh, more of the professionals you're encountering in the medical community are taking your your symptoms and your long COVID symptoms seriously? That's an interesting question. Um, I still uh, have shortness of breath. I'm using inhalers for that. I have still have hand tremors. Um, still have cognitive issues. I'm very limited as to who I'm seeing now, which are within the Vanderbilt system. And so most of those doctors are, <clears throat> excuse me, are well aware of long COVID and why I'm there. I don't think that that's the same for the general public and certainly not here in the South. Um, if you are on Twitter, there's there's a lot of stories that patients are still being gaslit. I didn't even know what that meant, but basically where the doctors are saying that this is purely psychological. If you rest, if you take medicine, if you go to the gym, then you'll get better. And none of those are true. You're also in cognitive therapy. Is that helping you, Frank? It's start, I believe it will because I've only started it for a couple of weeks, but the cognitive therapist is, is excellent. And she has been able to identify what she thinks some of my issues are, which are which may be different than other people's. So it sounds like there's a lot more research that needs to be done, and you're hoping to contribute to that. That's what led you to the Listen study at Yale. Can you tell us about that, and and how's it been going? Yes, uh, I met through a Washington Post article Harlan Crumholz, who's a cardiologist at Yale, and. As we talked, Harlan was the first doctor that I had spoken with that actually had compassion and said that the doctor should listen to their patients. And if they didn't listen to their patients, then they were doing a disservice. And, and not only that, but it was cruel. And so I emailed Harlan. He emailed back. We started talking. So uh, he and uh, Akiko Asaki at Yale have started the LISTEN study. And interestingly enough, that's just what it is. For those of us with long COVID, we don't want complex. It's listen. They, they intend to listen to us. We've done surveys with listen so they can group us into the various groups for researchers so that once that we get our medical data to them through Hugo Health and Kindred, then they will be able to take that, de-identify it, and take it to the researchers directly, which is something that it, I don't have the ability to do that. So, But they do because of their professionalism, and I think that this is probably going to be the leading study in the U.S. because, number one, is they care, and number two, is they've dedicated their lives now to this. Mm. Well, I'm glad to hear that you finally had a doctor respond to you with compassion, Frank, and now that you're involved in, in this study. Uh, you know, I wanted to get another perspective. Stay with us, Frank. Uh, on, on Zoom with us now is Kelly Custer, who's a long COVID patient in our state, um, she's actually a professor of writing at Western Connecticut State University. Kelly, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And, and similar to what I asked Frank, you know, when did you first get COVID and, and you know, what have you experienced since that time, Kelly? So I um, was ever, never actually tested positive for COVID. I had a, what we thought was a bad cold in March of 2020 at the beginning. And by the time I went in for a COVID test, it registered as negative. Um, the cold developed into the ground glass opacities in the lungs. Um, I had a, a, a peripheral blood clot um, and, and my, and one lung and it was decided that it was a false negative. Um, and so I continued to struggle through March, April, May, June. In July of 2020, I started to feel a little better. And the beginning of August, I suffered again with um, chest pain, shortness of breath, a lot of cognitive issues as well as, as Frank has discussed, um, continual headaches, um, the cognitive problems that were struggling with reading and writing, which was particularly problematic for me as a professor. And so I, I took a semester off from work um, to try to work with some doctors at Yale to get some answers. Mm. And so you're back at work now? I am back at work. I went back to work in January of 2021, and we were all online, which allowed for a lot less movement. Um, and then went ahead and have been working in person since, but have been very grateful um, for having a summer uh, to be able to 
take some time to continue to recover. Um, I felt o- over this past summer, so this would be summer of 2022, that I was able to get to about a 90% status. Um, I've had a sinus infection recently, Frank, we are um, uh, compatriots in that. And it seems to have triggered from what the doctor understands, a viral response again. So I am back to chest pain, shortness of breath, mm. headaches, um, and not sure where that will lead next. Mm. I'm sorry to hear that. I hope you start to feel better, Kelly. You know, Frank was describing, you know, how um, how doctors uh, responded to him uh, when these symptoms uh, that he started to experience uh, came up after getting COVID. And I'm wondering, you know, do you feel mm-hmm. like your doctors were listening to you and trying to help you um, as these uh, symptoms uh, were sustained? I had a, a different experience. Uh, my um, primary care physician was fantastic. Uh, absolutely listened, absolutely wanted to help, did a lot of research on her own, but knew that she just didn't know enough. I did go to Yale um, to several specialists and started um, in some of their early studies, but there was nothing on them, nothing of the scans to show what I was feeling. And so at a certain point, they just said there was nothing they could do. Um, And after hearing that more than once, I just stopped trying. Um, I stopped trying in spring of uh, 2021 to get any help. I went back again this past fall and past spring just to double check, got autoimmune testing. And again, there's nothing in the scans that show that I should be feeling like I'm feeling. Um, However, I know it's connected to COVID and it's not, it's not just in just me. So um, a, a, a great experience with a GP who tried, but I just think that people don't know enough about it. Right. It was interesting to hear Frank talk about the LISTEN study at Yale. Or were you familiar with that study as well, uh, Kelly, given you know some of the people you've seen down there? I was not. And Frank, I want to thank you because I did pull that up and do plan to join that. Um, I have looked at studies and have found some I I didn't qualify for because I didn't have that initial positive result um, and others that I wasn't considered severe enough. So I'm somebody who's sort of the under the radar and never back quite to what I was, um, but maybe not bad enough to be considered for some of those studies. But I do plan to join the LISTEN study. Mm. Uh, if you or someone you know uh, is experiencing long COVID symptoms, you can join us as well, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter uh, at Where We Live. Uh, Frank, you know, we started the show uh, focusing on the president's remarks uh, on 60 Minutes that the, quote, pandemic is over. And we know people naturally want to get back to life, what, what life was like back in 2019. But, you know, when you think about moving forward, um, you know, how do you want to see the general public or the medical community? What do you want them to consider? Because there are many Americans like yourself who are still living with symptoms after contracting COVID. I think that those uh, that statement was um, very unfortunate at best. I think it was irresponsible. Uh, there are, of course, the country wants to move forward. But by estimates, there may be as many as 2 million people like Kelly and myself, that cannot move forward as life was before, at least not at this point. I think that what that statement is going to do is going to add fuel to the fire of, well, the president said that the pandemic is over, so let's just move on. Uh, We don't need to continue with further testing. Everything is fine now. And I think that those, I think that 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 statement was very, uh, as I said, I think it was very irresponsible as, as it relates to the people who are dealing with long COVID. Mm -hmm. I would like to say one thing real quick, and and Kelly's exactly right. Excuse me. All of my scans came back also, and that's that's a very common theme. With those of us who have long COVID, most of us were very healthy, so we didn't have uh, baselines. So there's nothing to compare Mm -hmm. what we're dealing with now. And the only test for me is, did I have any of these things prior to having COVID? And when the answer is no, then that has to be where it came from. Right. Kelly, did you want to add to that? I completely agree. And Frank, thank you for saying that about the scans because shows like this are very important for us to know that we're not alone. Um, And again, I was healthy before and 
that's I know where what my status was before, but didn't have those baselines. So um, I appreciate the camaraderie. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I've, I've mentioned the general public and the medical community, but, you know, I'm also even thinking about how employers uh, should be thinking about this for, you know, the well-being of their uh, workforce, uh, for people, uh, many who have, uh, you know, COVID uh, symptoms that are lingering and, and, and making sure that, that those are being acknowledged. Uh, I'm wondering, Kelly and, and Frank, if you wanted to talk about that at all. Uh, I can. Gail, you want to go first? Go ahead, Frank. My thought is it puts the employers in a, in a very rough position mm-hmm. when this cannot get, quote, an official diagnosis. One thing I don't understand, and, and this is a whole different discussion, is about with disability for the people who are no longer able to work. I know several who can no longer work after this. And the president early on said that long COVID was under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Well, that's fine as long as you're able to work, then you can maybe get accommodations. The thing I don't understand is if it's covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act, why is it routinely denied by the government as a disability? Mm. Good point, Frank. Kelly, did you want to respond to? Um, I've had really um, good support from my my employer. Um, I think that I have been right on an edge of needing any support or not. So. Um, but I agree with you. I do have friends who have really struggled and have finally been able to get disability, but it just was a struggle on top of a struggle they were already dealing with. Mm. So I do think it's important that it's acknowledged. You've been hearing Kelly Custer again, a professor of writing at Western Connecticut State University. Kelly, thank you for sharing a little bit of your story. We hope that you're feeling better in the near future, and we'd love to hear back from you soon. Thanks so much. And Frank Ziegler joined us from Nashville. He's also experiencing long COVID symptoms. He's a participant in LISTEN. This is a long COVID study at Yale School of Medicine. Uh, Frank, any other thoughts you wanted to leave our listeners with? Uh, Just two things. Number one is I was very impressed with the commissioner, um, her background, her way of handling the pandemic, and her understanding of long COVID. The people of Connecticut are very fortunate to have her. And I appreciate you giving Kelly and myself the opportunity to to be on your show because it's shows like this that will get the word out to the general public and they will realize that there are people who may look normal and and seem to be normal to them that are actually struggling uh, greatly with with something that's unseen. Mm. Well, Frank, we appreciate your time. We'd love to hear more about the LISTEN a long COVID study again at Yale School of Medicine. We'll be checking in uh, over the next several months. And we thank you and hope that uh, you will also continue to recover. Thank you, Lucy. That's Frank Ziegler from Nashville. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today's show produced by Sujata Srinivasan. Our technical director is Kat Pastor. You can learn more about where we live anytime and listen anytime, rather. Download us on your favorite podcast app. Thanks for listening. <laughs>